Roberts Garen from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. Sir Roberts Randolph Garen, Order of St. Michael and St. George, Queen's Council, born 10 February 1867, died 11 January 1957, was an Australian lawyer and public servant, an early leading expert in Australian constitutional law, the first employee of the Government of Australia and the first Solicitor General of Australia. Garen spent 31 years as permanent head of the Attorney General's Department, providing advice to 10 different Prime Ministers, from Barton to Lyons. He played a significant behind-the-scenes role in the Australian Federation movements as advisor to Edmund Barton and chair of the drafting committee at the 1897 to 1898 Constitutional Convention. In addition to his professional work, Garen was also an important figure in the development of the city of Canberra during its early years. He founded several important cultural associations, organized the creation of the Canberra University College, and later contributed to the establishment of the Australian National University. Garen published at least eight books and many journal articles throughout his lifetime, covering such topics as constitutional law, the history of federalism in Australia, and German language poetry. This article contains five sections. The first section is about his early life. The second section is about his involvement in the Federation movement. The third section is about his involvement in the public service. Section 4 is about retirement, and Section 5 is about legacy. Section 1. Early Life Garen was born in Sydney, New South Wales, the only son among seven children of journalist and politician Andrew Garen and his wife Mary Isham. His parents were committed to social justice, Mary campaigning for issues such as the promotion of education for women, and Andrew advocating federation and covering reformist movements as editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, and later promoting them as a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council. The family lived in Phillips Street in central Sydney. Garen's mother, quote, had a deep distrust, well justified in those days, of Milkman's milk, end quote, and so she kept a cow in the backyard, which would walk on its own to the domain each day to graze and return twice a day to be milked. The Garrens later lived in the suburb of Darlinghurst, just to the east of the centre of the city. Garren attended Sydney Grammar School from the age of 10, starting in 1877. He was a successful student and became school captain in 1884. He then studied arts and law at the University of Sydney, where he was awarded scholarships for classics, mathematics and general academic ability. Garen graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree with first class honours in 1888, winning the university's medal in philosophy and a Bachelor of Laws degree in 1889. After graduating, Garen began to study for the bar examination. He was employed for a year with the firm of Sydney solicitors, and the next year served as an associate to Justice William Charles Windayer of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Windayer had a reputation for being a harsh and inflexible judge, particularly in criminal cases, where he was said to have, quote, a rigorous and unrelenting sense of the retribution that he believed criminal justice demanded, and a sympathy verging on the emotional for the victims of crime." End quote. Garen, however, offered a different view, saying that, quote, those who knew him well knew that under a brusque exterior he was the kindest of men, End quote. and his reputation had, to some degree, been created by misrepresentation. In 1891, Garen was admitted to the New South Wales Bar, where he commenced practice as a barrister, primarily working in equity. Section 2. Federation Movement Garen, 
like his father, was strongly involved in the Australian Federation movements, the movement which sought to unite the British colonies in Australia, and in early proposals, New Zealand, into one federated colony. The first constitutional convention was held in 1891 in the chamber of the Legislative Council of New South Wales, in Macquarie Street in Sydney, around the corner from Garin's chambers in Phillip Street. Garin regularly attended and sat in the public gallery to see, quote, history in the making under my very eyes, end quote. Garin would later recall with approval that the 1891 convention was the first with the courage to face the lie in the path, that is, the issue of customs duties and tariffs, which had previously divided states such as Victoria, who were in favour of protectionism, and states such as New South Wales, which were in favour of free trade. In Garin's view, a clause proposed at the convention, which allowed for tariffs against international trade, while ensuring free trade domestically, the predecessor to the final section 92 of the Australian Constitution, quote, expressed the terms on which New South Wales was prepared to face the lion, end quote. Garin became involved with the work of Edmund Barton, who would later become the first Prime Minister of Australia, but at the time was the de facto leader of the Federation movement in New South Wales, as Sir Henry Parks declined into poor health. Garin, along with others such as Attlee Hunt, worked essentially as secretaries to Barton's Federation campaign, drafting correspondence and planning meetings. At one late night meeting, planning a speech Barton was to give in the Sydney suburb of Ashfield, Barton coined the phrase, quote, For the first time we have a nation for a continent, and a continent for a nation. End quote. Garin recalled that the now famous phrase quote, would have been unrecorded if I had not happened to jot it down. End quote. In June 1893, when the Australasian Federal League was formed at the meeting in the Sydney Town Hall, Garin joined immediately and was made a member of the Executive Committee. He was one of the League's four delegates to the 1893 Koroa Conference and a League delegate to the 1896 Bathurst Conference, informal conferences held between members of the League, primarily based in Sydney, the Australian Natives Association, mainly Victorian, and other pro-Federation groups. At Koroa, he was part of an impromptu group organised by John Quick, which drafted a resolution passed at the conference calling on the colonial parliaments to hold directly elected constitutional convention to be charged with drafting the bill for the constitution of Australia. The proposal, which came to be known as the Koroa Plan, was later accepted at the 1895 Premier's Conference and formed the basis for the federation process over the following five years. In 1897, Garin published The Coming Commonwealth, an influential book on the history of the federation movement and the debates over the 1891 draft of the Constitution of Australia. The book was based on material he had prepared for a course on federalism and federal systems of government, which he had planned to give at the University of Sydney, but which failed to attract a sufficient number of students. Nevertheless, the book was both unique and popular, as one of the few books on the topic at the time, with the first edition quickly selling out. Soon after its publication, the Premier of New South Wales, George Reid, who had been elected as a New South Wales delegate to the 1897 to 1898 Constitutional Convention, invited Garin to be his secretary. At the convention, Reid appointed him secretary of the drafting committee at Barton's request. He was also a member of the press committee. Garin recorded in a letter to his family during the convention's Melbourne sitting that, quote, 
The committee professes to find me very useful in unravelling the conundrums set down by the Finance Committee. The last two nights I have found the drafting committee fagged and despairing, and now they have pitched the conundrums at me and gone out for a smoke. In them I worked out algebraic formulas to clear the thing up, drafted clauses accordingly, and when the committee returned we had plain sailing. End quote. Garin joked that the long work of the drafting committee breached the Factory Acts. The group, primarily Barton, Richard O'Connor, John Downer and Garin, often working late into the night preparing drafts for the convention to consider and debate the next morning. On the evening before the convention's last day, Barton had gone to bed exhausted in the small hours. Garin and Charles Gavin Duffy finishing the final schedule of amendments at breakfast time. The convention concluded successfully, approving a final draft which would, ultimately, aside from a small amendment arranged at the last minute in London, become the Constitution of Australia. Throughout 1898, following the completion of the proposed Constitution, Garin participated in the campaign promoting federation leading up to the referendums, at which the people of the colonies voted whether or not to approve the constitution. He contributed a daily column to the Evening News, and had humorous poems critiquing opponents of federation published in the bulletin. The following year, he began working with Quick on the annotated constitution of the Australian Commonwealth a reference work on the Constitution including a history and detailed discussion of each section, analysing its meaning and its developments at the conventions. Published in 1901, the annotated Constitution, commonly referred to simply as Quick and Garin, soon became the standard work on the Constitution and is still regarded as one of the most important works on the subject. Section 3. Public Service On the day the Federation was completed and Australia created, on 1 January 1901, Garin was made a Commander of the Order of St Michael and St George, and was appointed Secretary and Permanent Head of the Attorney General's Department by the first Attorney General of Australia, Alfred Deakin. Garin was the first, and for a time the only, public servants employed by the governments of Australia. Garin later said of this time that, quote, I was not only the head of the department, but the tail. I was my own clerk and messenger. My first duty was to write out with my own hand Commonwealth Gazette No. 1, proclaiming the establishment of the Commonwealth and the appointments of Ministers of State, and to send myself down with it to the government's printer." End quote. In this role, Garin was responsible for organising the first federal election in March 1901, and for organising the transfer of various government departments from the states to the federal government, including the Department of Defence, the Postal and Telegraphic Services, now part of the Department of Communication, Information Technology and the Arts and the Department of Trade and Customs, now part of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. As parliamentary drafter, Garin also developed legislation to administer these new departments and other important legislation. Garin and his fellow staff aimed for a simple style of legislative drafting, a goal enabled by the fact that there was no pre-existing federal legislation on which their work would have to be based. In Garin's opinion, the approach, which was put into practice many years before this similarly principled plain English movement became popular in government in the 1970s, was intended to set an example of clear, straightforward language free from technical jargon. Subsequent parliamentary drafters have noted that Garin was unusual in this respect for deliberately setting out to achieve and improve a particular drafting style, and that it was not until the early 1980s 
that such discipline among drafters re-emerged. However, Garan himself admitted that his drafting could be overly simplistic, citing the first Customs and Excise legislation, the Customs Act 1901 and the Excise Act 1901, developed with the Minister for Trade and Customs, Charles Kingston, as an example of the style taken to excess. The style was also once parodied by Foundation High Court Justice Richard O'Connor as follows. Quote, Every man shall wear A. Coat B. Vest C. Trousers Penalty 100 pounds. End quote. In 1902, Garin married Hilda Robson. Together they would have four sons, Richard, born 1903, John, born 1905, Andrew in 1906, and Isham in 1910. At this time, the family lived in Melbourne, and the boys all attended Melbourne Grammar School, and later studied at the University of Melbourne, attending Trinity College there. The Attorney General's Department also managed litigation on behalf of the government. Initially, the departments contracted private law firms to actually conduct the litigation. But in 1903, the Office of the Commonwealth Crown Solicitor was established, with Charles Powers the first to hold the job. The other Crown Solicitors that Garin worked with included Gordon Castle, with whom he had also worked as a drafter, and William Sharwood. Garin worked with several Attorney Generals as permanent head of the department. Garin regarded the first Attorney General, Alfred Deacon, as an excellent thinker and a natural lawyer, and on occasion, quote, spoke of Deacon as the Balfour of Australian politics, end quote. He was also very much impressed with the fifth Attorney General, Isaac Isaacs, who was an extremely diligent worker, and two-time Attorney General, Littleton Groom, who was, quote, probably one of the most useful ministers the Commonwealth has had, end quote. In 1912, Garin was considered as a possible appointee to the High Court, following the expansion of the bench from five seats to seven, and the death of Richard O'Connor. Billy Hughes, Attorney General in the Fisher government at the time, later said Garin would have been appointed, quote, but for the fact that he is too valuable a man for us to lose, we cannot spare him. End quote. Section 3.1 Solicitor General In 1916, Garin was made the first Solicitor General of Australia. The office was then known as the Commonwealth Solicitor General by Billy Hughes, who has since become Prime Minister. The creation of the office and Garin's appointment to it was to some degree recognition of his existing role as permanent head of the Attorney General's Department, in which Garin gave legal advice to several successive governments, but it also represented a formal delegation of many of the powers and functions formally exercised by the Attorney General. Garin developed a strong relationship with Hughes, giving him legal advice on the World War I conscription plebiscites, and on the range of regulations which were made under the War Precautions Act 1914. The War Precautions Regulations had a broad scope and were generally supported by the High Court, which adopted a much more flexible approach to the reach of the Commonwealth's defence power during wartime. A substantial amount of Garin's work during the war involved preparing and carrying out the regulations. Many of them were directed at maximising the economic aspect of the war efforts and ensuring supplies of goods to Australian troops. Others were directed at controlling citizens or former citizens of the enemy central powers living in Australia. The partnership between Garin and Hughes is regarded by some as unusual, given that Garin was, quote, tall, gentlemanly, wise and scholarly, end quote, and patient with his staff, whereas Hughes was, quote, short of stature and renowned for bursts of temper, end quote. Nevertheless, the partnership was a successful one, with Hughes recognising the importance of Garin's constitutional expertise 
remarking once about the World War I period that, quote, the best way to govern Australia was to have Sir Robert Garron at my elbow, with a fountain pen and a blank sheet of paper, and the War Precautions Act, end quote. Likewise, Garron respected Hugh's strong leadership style, which had been important in guiding the country through the war, although in describing the Nationalist Party's loss in the 1922 federal election, Garron later said that, quote, Hughes also overestimated his own hold on Parliament, although his hold on the people was probably undiminished. End quote. Garron accompanied Hughes and Joseph Cook, then the Minister for the Navy, to the 1917 and 1918 meetings of the Imperial War Cabinet in London, United Kingdom, and was also part of the British Empire delegation to the 1919 Paris Peace Conference in Paris, France. There, he was on several of the treaty drafting committees and contributed to many provisions, notably the portions of the League of Nations Covenant relating to the League of Nations mandates. Though focusing mainly on League of Nations matters, Garen and John Latham, the head of the Australian Naval Intelligence, had the status of technical advisers to Hughes and Cook, and so could attend the main conference and any of the associated councils. Observing the proceedings, Garen admired the, quote, moral and physical courage, end quote, of French Premier Georges Clemenceau, whom he regarded as determined to protect France from Germany, but in a measured and temperate way. In Garin's words, Clemenco, quote, always withstood the excessive demands of the French chauvinists, of the French army, and of Foch himself, end quote. Garin viewed some similarities between British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and the United States President Woodrow Wilson, where others only saw differences, since Lloyd George, quote, also had a strong vein of idealism in his character, end quote, and Wilson could be pragmatic when the situation called for it, such as in discussions relating to American interests. Garrett also met other political and military leaders at the conference, including T. E. Lawrence, quote, an Oxford youth of 29, he looks 18, end quote, who was modest and, quote, Without any affection, in a company of two or three, he could talk very interestingly, but at a larger gathering, he was apt to be dumb. End quote. Following the war, Garron worked with Professor Harrison Moore of the University of Melbourne and South Australian judge Professor Jethro Brown on a report about proposed constitutional amendments, which ultimately became the referendum questions put forward in the 1919 referendum. Garin had been made a Knight's Bachelor in 1917 and was appointed as a Knight's Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in 1920. Garin attended two Imperial Conferences, accompanying Prime Minister Stanley Bruce in 1923 and in 1930 joining Prime Minister James Scullin and Attorney General Frank Brennan, chair of the drafting committee which prepared drafts of agreements on various topics, such as merchant shipping. He also attended the 11th League of Nations conference that year with them in Geneva, Switzerland. At the Royal Commission on the Constitution in 1927, Garin was invited to give evidence by Prime Minister Bruce where he discussed the history and origins of the Constitution and the evolution of the institutions established under it. Through the 1920s and early 1930s, Garin prepared annual summaries of legislative developments in Australia, highlighting important individual pieces of legislation for the Journal of Comparative Legislation and International Law now known as the International and Comparative Law Quarterly, published by Oxford University Press. In 
Towards the end of his time as Solicitor General, Garin's work included the preparation of the debt conversion agreements between the governments of Australia and the governments of the states, which involved the federal government taking over and managing the debts of the individual states, following the 1928 referendum. In 1927, Garin had moved from his home in Melbourne, Victoria, to the newly established capital Canberra, one of the first public officials to do so. Many government departments and their public servants did not move to Canberra until after World War II. He also worked within the government to facilitate housing in Canberra for officials moving from other cities and was involved in establishing cultural organisations in the city. In 1928, he was the inaugural president of the Canberra Rotary Club. In 1929, he formed the Canberra University Association in order to promote the formation of a university in Canberra, and in 1930, organised the establishment of Canberra University College, which was essentially a campus of the University of Melbourne, which taught undergraduate courses. He chaired its council for its first 23 years. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, Garin, quote, consistently advocated the establishment of what he prophetically called a national university at Canberra, end quote, which would be primarily for this specialist research and postgraduate study in areas particularly relating to Australia, such as foreign relations with Asia and the Pacific region. This vision was evidently influential on the establishment of the Australian National University, ANU, in 1946, the only research-only university in the country, although in 1960 it amalgamated with Canberra University College to offer undergraduate courses. Section 4. Retirement. Garin retired from his departmental positions on 9 February 1932 a fixed retirement date on the day before his 65th birthday. He soon returned to practice as a barrister, and within a month he was made a King's Counsel. However, he occasionally carried out more prominent work. In 1932, he was selected on the advice of now Attorney General John Latham to chair the Indian Defence Expenditure Tribunal to advise on the disputes between India and the United Kingdom regarding the costs of the military defence of India. In 1934, along with John Keating, William Somerville and David Gilbert, he formed a committee which prepared the Case for Union, the Government of Australia's official reply to the secessionist movement in the state of Western Australia. Garin was also involved with the arts. He was the Vice President of the Canberra Musical Society, where he sang and played the clarinet, and in 1946 won a national song competition run by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Garin also published translations of Heinrich Heine's 1827 work, Buch der Lieder, Book of Songs, in 1924 and of the works of Franz Schubert and Robert Schumann in 1946. In 1937, Garin was made a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, the third time he had been knighted. Shortly after the establishment of the ANU in 1946, Garin became its first graduate when he was awarded an Honorary Doctorate of Laws. He had already been awarded such an honorary doctorate from the University of Melbourne in 1937 and later receiving one from his alma mater, the University of Sydney, in 1952. Garin served on ANU's council from 1946 until 1951. Garin's influence on Canberra is remembered by the naming of the suburb of Garin in the Australian Capital Territory and his link with ANU is remembered by the naming of a chair in the university's School of Law, by the naming of the Hall of Residence, Burton and Garen Hall, 
and by the naming of Garen House at Canberra Grammar School for his work with that school. Garen died in 1957 in Canberra. He was granted a state funeral, the first given to a public servant of the government of Australia. He was survived by his four sons. His wife Hilda had died in 1936. His memoirs, Prosper the Commonwealth, were published posthumously in 1958, having been completely shortly before his death. Section 5. Legacy. Garrett's, quote, personality, like his prose, was devoid of pedantry and pomposity, and though dignified, was laced with a quizzical turn of humour, end quote. His death, quote, marked the end of a generation of public men for whom the cultural and the political were natural extensions of each other and who had the skills and the talents to make such connections effortlessly, end quote. At his death, Garin was one of the last remaining of the people involved with the creation of the Constitution of Australia. Former Prime Minister John Howard, in describing Garin, said, quote, I wondered, though, if we sometimes underestimate the changes, excitements, disruptions and adjustments previous generations have experienced. Sir Robert Garin knew the promise and reality of Federation. He was part of the establishment of a public service which, in many ways, is clearly recognisable today. End quote. Garin's friend Charles Daly, a long-time civic administrator of the Australian Capital Territory, emphasised Garin's contribution to the early developments of the city of Canberra, particularly its cultural life, remarking at a celebratory dinner for Garin in 1954 that, quote, There has hardly been a cultural movement in this city with which Sir Robert has not been identified in loyal and inspiring support, as his constant aim has been that Canberra should be not only a great political centre, but also a shrine to foster those things that stimulate and enrich our national life. His name will ever be inscribed in the annals, not only of Canberra, but of the Commonwealth, as Clarum et Venerable Nomen Gentibus. End quote. However, Garen is best remembered as an expert on constitutional law, more so than for his other contributions to public service. On his expertise of federation and the constitution, Garen was always enthusiastic. Quote, I'm often asked, has federation turned out as you expected? Well, yes and no. By and large, the sort of thing we expected has happened, but with differences. We knew the constitution was not perfect. It had to be a compromise with all the faults of a compromise. But, in spite of the unforeseen strains and stresses, the Constitution has worked, on the whole, much as we thought it would. I imagine it now needs revision, to meet the needs of a changed world. But no one could wish the work undone, who tries to imagine what, in these stormy days, would have been the plight of six disunited Australian colonies. End quote. Section 5.1 Memorials In 1983, the former Patent Office Building, now occupied by the Federal Attorney General's Department, was renamed the Robert Garrett Offices. The Art Deco Building that is within the Parliamentary Triangle of Canberra and was constructed in 1932 of the corner of Kings Avenue and National Circuit in Parks, Australian Capital Territory. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org/copyleft/fdl.html.